Hello, Global Ideas Forum. Uh, first up, thank you, Ranji, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's an absolute pleasure for me. And secondly, apologies for not being able to make it there in person. Uh, I'm glad I was still able to uh, video link in, but the lineup looked absolutely amazing. I'm very sad not to be able to see it in person. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a concept I call effective altruism. It's an idea that profoundly changed my life. It has led me to pledge to give about 10 to 20 percent of my graduate stipend. So I'm still doing a PhD at Oxford and I'm giving about 10 percent of what I live on to the most cost-effective development charities. It's led me to pledge to give everything I earn above 20,000 pounds per year. That's about 30,000 Australian dollars. Uh, that's set to be 50 or 60 percent of what I earn over the course of my life. It's led me to radically change my research focus, so I now work on something very different than what I used to before. It's also led me to set up a couple of non-profits that have spawned something of a social movement. So this has been an incredibly important idea for me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it is. So as an overview, effective altruism has three parts. It has a why, a how, and a what. The why is the aim to do as much good as you can. Many people say, oh, you should make a difference. But effective altruism isn't about making a difference. It's about making the most difference you can. The second is the how. I mean, how do you decide which cause to focus on? And I'll talk to you about the best scientific research and reasoning that allows you to work out what are the causes that do the very most good. The third is the what. What do people who call themselves effective altruists actually do? And I'll tell you a little bit about that, as will Ryan Carey, who will follow me in the talk. So, let's start with this first part, and I'll tell you a bit about how I just got interested in this at the start. So, after I graduated from Cambridge, after I did my undergraduate degree, I uh, started work as a fundraiser for Care International, this large international development charity. And it meant that all day, every day, I was talking about what are the I was talking about global poverty and the seriousness, and I was encouraging people to give money to it, and I was just encountered by apathy um, over and over again in general. Most people just seemed not to care, and that just seemed uh, terrible to me. Um, I was talking about how there were 1.4 billion people living on less than $1.25 per day, and in the course of the work I was doing there, I learned that this $1.25 a day that doesn't mean what, you know, what $1.25 could buy in Kenya, let's say, where the money goes much further. It, was, it means what $1.25 would buy in the US in 2005. That is, that number's purchasing power parity adjusted. That, and if you think about that, what could $1.25 um, buy? Less than a bag of rice. But that's what, the, that's what people in the developing world, 1.4 billion people, that's what they were living on every single day. And I thought to myself, how can I, yeah, just how can it be morally justified for me to be buying luxuries and pursuing this esoteric philosophy career uh, while so many people are living in such dire conditions? Um, so that made me think, you know, I want to help. But I didn't know the answers. I didn't know what I ought to do. Um, should I be focusing on education? Should I be focusing on female empowerment? Should I be focusing on health, if within health? Should it be AIDS, tuberculosis? Um, should I be concerned about malaria? All these seemed um, entirely open to me, and uh, I didn't know um, which cause I should be focusing on. I did know, however, that I wanted to make the most difference. So, um, as I said before, many charities say, oh, you find your passion and then you follow your passion. But that just seemed, just couldn't be morally justified to me. The seriousness of the problem, if I could help someone more by doing a different cause, even if I was less passionate about that, or hadn't thought of it previously, then surely I'm required to do that. So that takes me on to the second part of um, effective altruism, the how. And the how is, how do you decide which cause you should um, pursue? And this is absolutely crucially important. So. I'll give you an illustration of two different types of social intervention. So, one was Play Pumps International. Um, I think they got quite famous in Australia. Uh, and the idea, for those who don't know, so Trevor Fields was um, this kind of hotshot uh, social entrepreneur, and he had this, he championed this idea of play pumps. And the idea is, rather than having a manual uh, pump to pump out water in poor countries, 
they had a playground merry-go-round and children would push the merry-go-round and using their force of the children playing in the merry-go-round, water would be pumped out of the ground. And this was just a media sensation. Um, many, many news outlets absolutely loved it. Um, it won awards. Uh, Laura Bush, the first lady at the time, gave it a $14 million grant in order to um, uh, apply these play pumps all around the developing world. So it seemed like an incredibly exciting thing, this new concept. The only problem with it was that it was a terrible idea. So the play pumps had a number of problems. The most basic was the fact that they were less good at pumping water than typical hand pumps, while costing three times the price. Um, even worse, though, is that the children obviously would get incredibly tired playing with these pumps. So it's unlike normal um, playground merry-go-round, you can push them, and then the sheer force and the momentum just keeps them spinning. But because they need torque in order to pump the water, you had to keep pushing the playground merry-go-round. So the children found it incredibly tiring. Um, some would also fall off and break their arms, uh, which was a, another unintended but bad side effect. So in general, it wasn't the children pushing them, it was um, typically the women, often the elderly women of the village, and they'd find it incredibly embarrassing, and again, incredibly tiring. Um, they'd be pushing, pushing these play pumps kind of all day and all night, and sometimes being sick through exertion and so on, um, and not even getting less water than they would have had through a typical hand pump. They were also never consulted about this. Uh, so many of them, in interviews afterwards, uh, said they would have much rather have had just a normal hand pump. But that's not what... that wasn't the kind of sexy new idea. So, thankfully, and uh, in something that's quite honourable, doesn't often happen in the charity world, uh, Trevor Field and Play Pumps International acknowledged that the whole programme had been a disaster, and they subsequently closed. Um, and that's like... actually they should be praised for doing that, for admitting that um, something wasn't working and so they stopped. But that was an example where someone wanted to do good and they focused on a specific cause that they were excited about, but they hadn't done their homework, they hadn't tried to work out, well, is this really the best thing to do? Uh, and then you're going to contrast that with what I think is the most effective example of aid that um, the world's ever seen, and that's the eradication of smallpox. So in the 20th century, uh, smallpox killed more people than all wars, all political famines, all genocides, and all terrorist acts combined. Um, all of those things killed about 188 million people. Smallpox killed about 300 million. Yet we eradicated it in about 1973. Um, and since then, we've saved, because of the eradication of smallpox, we've saved 122 million lives, and countless more examples of disfigurement and horrific suffering. And how much did this cost? How much does this amazing feat cost? It only cost $1.4 billion. That works out as a cost of $12 for every life saved. In fact, smallpox was such an effective intervention um, that even if you take all aid spending and assume it was all wasted, except insofar as we eradicated smallpox, then all aid spending would still be incredibly effective, saving a life for only $20,000. So there's this huge range in terms of what causes do the most good, or do huge amounts of good with the money you put in, and what actually achieve very little, or can even do harm, like Play Pumps International. And that makes it absolutely crucially important to determine the right cause. And determining the right cause, unfortunately, just doesn't involve simply following your passion. The world is too complicated for that. It involves doing your homework, being a bit of a geek. So the best institutes um, for this are Poverty Action Lab, Innovations for Poverty Action, um, Give Well as well, also Disease Control Priorities Project. And what they do is take the latest academic research that does randomized controlled trials in the developing world and general economic theory in order to work out what are those interventions that are going to help the most. Um, and then just as those, that advice is commonly used to advise developing world governments on how they can spend their scarce resources, the same advice can apply to individuals when you're deciding where you should give to um, with your charitable donations, or what sort of causes you should be working on in your career. And so the current most effective causes that we recommend are insect long-lasting insecticide treated bed nets. So this is incredibly cheap, it costs about $5, including distribu distribution costs, administration costs, to distribute one long-lasting insecticide treated bed net that um, will provide two children with cover for four years. The other is um, 
uh, deworming pills. So, something you may not have heard of, but it's incredibly devastating and debilitating in the developing world are neglected tropical diseases, especially soil transmitted helmets. Um, basically, it's just worms that live in your body. They don't kill nearly as many people as tuberculosis, AIDS, or malaria, but they do make um, well over a billion people very sick and preventing them from going to school. But the, even though I think this, these aren't the biggest health problems in the world, I think um, the kind of total mortality and morbidity from tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and uh, malaria greater, what makes a um, statement of neglected tropical diseases um, incredibly important is just how cheap it is. So these drugs that can uh, treat them were developed in the 50s. You can uh, give a package of four drugs that cures the seven most prevalent neglected tropical diseases for only 50 cents per child. That includes all administration costs, it includes all distribution costs, it includes all the costs of uh, um, paying for the drugs, um, screen, um, screening people for determining who to give to and who not. So if you focus on these very most um, cost-effective interventions, you can do huge amounts of good. And when they, when they exist, it just seems like you're not taking the problem of global poverty seriously um, unless you're focusing um, on these causes or something perhaps even better, rather than just following your passion. So that's the second aspect, the how we determine um, what causes to focus on. Third is the what, then. And I've told you a little bit about that in terms of the causes we recommend. Um, but importantly, for an effective altruist approach, the what is contingent. So where there's many charities and many people determining what they want to do with their lives think, oh, start with the what. They say, I'm really passionate about developing world sanitation or clean water or something, and then want to focus on that. Whereas I think that gets the cart before, before the horse. What you want to do is um, help people as much as possible. And you should let the what be determined by what does the most good. And so, uh, for us, the what is kind of always provisional. Um, what we think is the most important thing is always revisable in the light of new evidence. And if we find out something that will do even more good, then um, we'll do that instead. And so I'll talk, there are now a kind of cluster of organizations that um, would self-identify as effective altruist organizations. Um, I have founded a couple. So one is Giving What We Can, which Ryan Carey will tell you more about following my talk. The second I'll talk a little bit about is 80,000 hours. And 80,000 hours is called that because that's the number of hours you'll typically work in the course of your life. And the idea is, look, just as we can give money to the developing world or m use our money to help uh, um, help fight poverty and do good, we can also use our time, we can also use our careers. And at the moment, there's just very little high quality advice on how to use your careers for good. And that's what AD1000 Hours wants to help, wants to provide. Um, and so if you're interested in using your career to do as much good as you can, then I'll urge you to talk to 80,000 Hours. Often, um, and again, this is part of not simply just following what you're passionate about, we typically don't recommend careers just working for the normal not-profit, non-profit, working for Oxfam or Care or Fed Hollows Foundation or something. The reason for that is that labor's already oversupplied. They've already got huge numbers of people wanting to work for them. So if you take a position there, you're just replacing someone else, who, almost as good as you, who would have been working for that charity instead. So instead, we recommend a wide range of careers, including in many forms of entrepreneurship, including in the private sector, including some advocacy positions, positions of influence in places like politics, positions where you've got huge amounts of power to do an awful lot of good. So a few stories of people in the community, often people we've helped. Uh, one is Holly Morgan, so she's only 21, I think. Maybe she's turned 22. And she's already running a major international charity called Life You Can Save, which is kind of like a sister organization to Giving What We Can. It encourages people to give at least 1% of their um, earnings to these most cost-effective charities. It has over 16,000 members, people who've pledged this, and it's um, the champion cause of Peter Singer. And through her involvement in the effective altruism community, she was able to help develop this from what was just a book and a website into a full-growing um, charity and organization and campaigning organization. And it looks set to be absolutely huge. Another person is, uh, he prefers to name it anonymous, but let's call him James. And he had the idea of, instead of working directly for a charity, well, their labor oversupplied and money poor, 
So why should I not take a look at the in order that I can donate more to those causes? And so that's what he's done. He's taken a high-earning career, and in his first year and a half alone, he's able to donate over two hundred thousand dollars. And that's absolutely incredible if you think about the impact that can have. Referring back to deworming, that's enough to deworm four hundred thousand children. Um, and he's managed to do that in his first year and a half out of university. He's only twenty-three years old. Final person I'll talk about again, who wishes to remain anonymous, but. Let's call him Jack. He's done, I think, even more good again. Um, he's been an absolute pioneer. Rather than thinking, oh, I can earn money and move it, well, I want to take this position of influence where I can uh, affect the decisions of, like, important budgeting decisions. And he worked in the World Bank, and he worked as a program officer. So when they were determining how to allocate uh, funds between different uh, interventions, he was the person kind of making that last decision. And that meant he was able to influence over $500 million to more cost-effective causes. And he's just one person. Um, so if you're, and the kind of lesson from this is just, if you're really dedicated to helping people as much as possible, it's absolutely amazing the amount of good that you can do. So let's recap before I let uh, Ryan Carey fill you in on giving what we can. Giving, um, effective altruism is a why, a how, and a what. The why is just aiming to do as much good as possible. The how is using the best scientific evidence and um, just high quality reasoning, thinking, how can I do the most good? And then um, letting the what be determined by that. So the third part of the what is giving what we can, which Ryan Carey will tell you about. 80,000 hours, um, which advises you on what careers to pursue. And if you are thinking, yeah, this all makes sense. Um, I don't want to simply follow my passion. I want to just do what will help the most. Then I'll urge you to either talk to Ryan afterwards or um, contact 80,000 Hours and we can provide you with in-depth advice and we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Um, so that's what Effective Altruism is. Um, I hope you feel at least somewhat as inspired as I feel and thank you so much for letting me speak again.